Chapter 8 This is royal. Let those who went up through Spain make the best of it. These dominions of the Emperor of Morocco suit our little party well enough. We have had enough of Spain at Gibraltar for the present. Tangier is the spot we have been longing for all the time. Elsewhere we have found foreign-looking things and foreign-looking people, but always with things and people intermixed that were familiar with before. And so the novelty of the situation lost a deal of its force. We wanted something thoroughly and uncompromisingly foreign, foreign from the top to bottom, foreign from center to circumference, foreign inside and outside and all around, nothing anything about it to dilute its foreignness, nothing to remind us of any other people or any other land under the sun. And lo, in Tangier we have found it, here is not the slightest thing that ever we have seen save in pictures. And we always mistrusted the pictures before. We cannot any more. The pictures used to seem exaggerations. They seemed too weird and fanciful for reality. But behold, they were not wild enough. They were not fanciful enough. They have not told half the story. Tangier is a foreign land if ever there was one, and the true spirit of it can never be found in any book save the Arabian Nights. Here are no white men visible, yet swarms of humanity are all about us. Here is a packed and jammed city enclosed in a massive stone wall which is more than a thousand years old. All the houses... Nearly are one and two story, made of thick stone walls, plastered outside and square as a dry good box. Flat as a floor on top, no cornices, whitewashed all over, a crowded city of snowy tombs. And the doors are arched with the peculiar arch we see in the Moorish pictures. The floors are laid in varicolored diamond flags, in tessellated, many-colored porcelain squares wrought in the furnaces of fairs, in red tiles and broad bricks that time cannot wear. There is no furniture in the rooms of Jewish dwellings save divans. What there is in Moorish ones no man may know within their sacred walls no Christian dog can enter, and the streets are oriental, some of them three feet wide, some six, but only two that are over a dozen. A man can blockade the most of them by extending his body across them. Isn't it an oriental picture? There are stalwart Bedouins of the desert here, and stately Moors, proud of a history that goes back to the night of time and Jews whose fathers fled hither centuries upon centuries ago, and swarthy, swarthy Riffians from the mountains, born cutthroats and original genuine Negroes as black as Moses, and howling dervishes and a hundred breeds of Arabs, all sorts and descriptions of people that are foreign and curious to look upon. And the dresses are strange beyond all description. Here is a bronzed moor in a prodigious white turban, curiously embroidered, ja embroidered jacket, gold and crimson sash of many folds, wrapped round and round his waist, trousers that only come a little below his knee, and yet have twenty yards of stuff in them. Ornamented, ornamented scimitar, bare shins, stockingless feet, yellow slippers, and a gun of preposterous length. A mere soldier. I thought he was the emperor, at least. And here are aged moors with flowing white beards and long white robes with vast cowls, and Bedouins with long, cowled, striped cloaks and Negroes and Riffians with heads clean-shaven except a kinky scalp, 
lock back of the ear, or rather upon the after corner of the skull, and all sorts of barbarians in all sorts of weird costumes, and all more or less ragged. And here are Moorish women who are enveloped from head to foot in coarse white robes, and whose sex can only be determined by the fact that they leave only one eye visible and never look at men of their own race or are looked at them in, looked at by them in public. Here are 5,000 Jews in blue gabardines, sashes about their waists, slippers upon their feet, little skull caps on the backs of their heads, hair combed down on the forehead, and cut straight across the middle of it from side to side. The self-same fashion their Tangier ancestors have worn for I don't know how many bewildering centuries. Their feet and ankles are bare. Their noses are all hooked and hooked alike. They all resemble each other so much that one could almost believe they were of one family. Their women are plump and pretty and do smile upon a Christian in a way which is, in the last degree, comforting. What a funny old town it is. It seems like profanation to laugh and jest and bandy the frivolous chat of our day amid its hoary relics. Only the stately phraseology and the measured speech of the sons of the prophet are suited to a venerable antiquity like this. Here is a crumbling wall that was old when Columbus discovered America. It was old when Peter the Hermit roused the knightly men of the Middle Ages to arm for the First Crusade. It was old when Charlemagne and his paladins beleaguered enchanted castles and battled with giants and genie in the fabled days of the olden time. It was old when Christ and his disciples walked the earth stood where it stands today when the lips of Memon were vocal and men bought and sold in the streets of ancient Thebes. The Phoenicians, the Carthaginians, the English, Moors, Romans, all have battled for Tangier. All have won it and lost it. Here is a ragged, oriental-looking negro from some desert place in interior Africa filling his goatskin with water from a stained and battered fountain built by the Romans 1,200 years ago. Yonder is a ruined arch of a building, built a bridge built by Julius Caesar 1,900 years ago. Men who had seen the infant savior in the virgin's arms have stood upon it, maybe. Near it, are the ruins of a dockyard where Caesar repaired his ship and loaded, it, loaded them with grains when he invaded Britain 50 years before the Christian era. Here, under the quiet stars, these old streets seem thronged with the phantoms of forgotten ages. My eyes are resting upon a spot where stood a monument which was seen and described by Roman history, historians less than 2,000 years ago, whereon was inscribed, We are the Canaanites. We are they that have been driven out of the land of Canaan by the Jewish robber Joshua. Joshua drove them out, and they came here. Not many leagues from here is a tribe of Jews whose ancestors fled thither after an unsuccessful revolt against King David. And these, their descendants, are still under a ban and keep to themselves. Tangier has been mentioned in history for 3,000 years, and it was a town, though a queer one, when Hercules, clad in his lion skin, landed here 4,000 years ago. In these streets, he met Anitus, the king of the country, and brained him with his club which was the fashion among gentlemen in those days. The people of Tangier, called Tingis then, lived in the rudest possible huts and dressed in skins and carried clubs, and were as savage as the wild beasts they were constantly obliged to war with. But they were a gentlemanly race and did no work. 
They lived on the natural products of the land. Their king's country residence was at the famous Garden of Hesperides, 70 miles down the coast from here. The garden, with its golden apples, oranges, is gone now. No vestige of it remains. Antiquarians concede that such a personage as Hercules did exist in ancient times and agree that he was an enterprising and energetic man, but declined to believe him a god. Bonafide god, because that would be unconstitutional. Down here at Cape Spartel is the celebrated cave of Hercules, where that hero took refuge when he was vanquished and driven out of the Tangier country. It is full of inscriptions in the dead languages, which fact makes me think Hercules could not have traveled much, else he would not have kept a journal. Five days' journey from here, say 200 miles, are the ruins of an ancient city from whose history there is neither record nor tradition, and yet its arches, its columns, and its statues proclaim it to have been built by an enlightened race. The general size of a store in Tangier is about that of an ordinary shower bath in a civilized land. The Muhammadman, Muhammadan merchant, tin man, shoemaker, or vendor of trifles sits cross-legged on the floor and reaches after any article you may want to buy. You can rent a whole block of these pigeonholes for $50 a month. The market people crowd the marketplace with their baskets of figs, dates, melons, apricots, etc., and among them file trains of laden asses, not much larger, if any, than a Newfoundland dog. The scene is lively, is picturesque, and smells like a police court. The Jewish money changers have their dens close at hand, and all day long are counting bronze coins and transferring them from one bushel basket to another. They don't coin much money nowadays, I think. I saw none, but was dated four or five hundred years back, and was badly worn and battered. These coins are not very valuable. Jack went out to get a Napoleon changed so as to have money suited to the general cheapness of things, and came back and said he had swamped the bank, had bought eleven quarts of coin, and the head of the firm had gone to the street to negotiate for the balance of the change. I bought nearly half a pint of their money for a shilling myself. I am not proud on account of having so much money, though. I care nothing for wealth. The Moors have some small silver coins and also some silver slugs worth a dollar each. The latter are exceedingly scarce, so much so that when a poor ragged Arab sees one, they beg to be allowed to kiss it. They have also a small golden coin worth two dollars, and that reminds me of something. When Morocco is in a state of war, Arab couriers carry letters through the country and charge a liberal, po liberal postage. Every now and then they fall into the hands of marauding bands and get robbed. Therefore, warned by experience, as soon as they have collected two dollars worth of money, they exchange it for one of those little gold pieces, and when robbers come upon them, swallow it. The stratagem was good while it was unsuspected, but after that the marauders simply gave the sagacious United States mail an emetic and sat down to wait. The emperor of Morocco is a soulless despot, and the great officers under him are despots on a smaller scale. There is no regular system of taxation, but when the emperor or the bashaw want money, they levy on some rich man, and he has to furnish the cash or go to prison. Therefore, few men in Morocco dare to be rich. It is too dangerous a luxury. Vanity occasionally leads a man to display wealth, but sooner or later the emperor trumps up a charge against him, 
any sort of one will do, and confiscates his property. Of course, there are many rich men in the empire, but their money is buried, and they dress in rags and counterfeit prop poverty. Every now and again, the emperor imprisons a man who is a suspected of the crime of being rich and makes things so uncomfortable for him that he is forced to discover where he has hidden his money. Moors and Jews sometimes place themselves under the protection of the foreign consuls, and then they can flout their riches in the emperor's face with impunity. Chapter 9 about the first adventure we had yesterday afternoon, after landing here, came near, came near finishing that heedless blucher. We had just mounted some mules and asses and started out under the guardianship of the stately, the princely, the magnificent Haji Muhammad Lamarty, may his tribe increase, when we came upon a fine Moorish mosque with tall tower rich with checkerwork of many-colored porcelain, and every part and portion of the edifice adorned with the quaint architecture, architecture of the Alhambra, and Blucher started to ride into the open doorway. A startling, Hi! Hi! from our camp followers, and a loud, loud, Halt! from an English gentleman in the party checked the adventurer, and then we were informed that so dire a profanation is it for a Christian dog to set foot upon the sacred threshold of a Moorish mosque that no amount of purification can ever make it fit for the faithful to pray in again? Had Blucher succeeded in entering the place, he would no doubt have been chased through the town and stoned. And the time has been, and not many years ago either, when a Christian would have been most ruthlessly slaughtered if captured in a mosque. We caught a glimpse of the handsome, tessellated pavements within and of the devotees performing their ablutions at the fountains, but even that we took that, glim that, even that, we took that glimpse was a thing not relished by the Moorish bystanders. Some years ago, the clock in the tower of the mosque got out of order. The Moors of Tangier have so degenerated that it has been long since there was an artificer among them, capable of curing so delicate a patient as a debilitated clock. The great men of the city met in solemn conclave to consider how the difficulty was to be met. They discussed the matter thoroughly, but arrived at no solution. Finally, a patriarch arose and said, O oh, children of the prophet, it is known unto you that a Portuguese dog of a Christian clockmender pollutes the city of Tangier with his presence. Yet know also that when mosques are builded, asses bear the stones and the cement and the cross and cross the sacred threshold. Now, therefore, send the Christian dog on all fours and barefoot into the holy place to mend the clock, and let him go as an ass. And in that way it was done. Therefore, if Blucher ever sees the inside of a mosque, he will have to cast aside his humanity and go in his natural character. We visited the jail and found Moorish prisoners making mats and baskets. This thing of utilizing crime savors of civilization. Murder is punished with death. A short time ago, three murderers were taken beyond the city walls and shot. Moorish guns are not good, and neither are Moorish marksmen. In this instance, they set up the poor criminals at long range like so many targets, and practiced on them. Kept them hopping about and dodging bullets for half an hour before they managed to drive the center. When a man steals cattle, they cut off his right hand and left leg and nail them up in the marketplace as a warning to everybody. Their surgery is not artistic. They slice around the bone a little, then break off the limb. Sometimes the patient gets well, but as a general thing, he don't. However, the Moorish heart is stout. The Moors were always brave. 
These criminals undergo the fearful operation without a wince, without a tremor of any kind, without a groan. No amount of suffering can bring down the pride of a moor or make him shame his dignity with a cry. Here, marriage is contracted by the parents of the parties to it. There are no valentines, no stolen interviews, no riding out, no courting in dim parlors, no lovers' quarrels and reconciliations, no nothing that is proper to approach in matrimony. The young man takes the girl his father selects for him, marries her, and after that she is unveiled and he sees her for the first time. If, after due acquaintance, she suits him, he retains her, but if he suspects her purity, he bundles her back to her father. If he finds her diseased, the same, or if, after just an unreasonable time is allowed her, she neglects to bear children, back she goes to the home of her childhood. Muhadamans here, who can afford it, keep a good many wives on hand. They are called wives, though I believe the Koran only allows four genuine wives. The rest are concubines. The emperor of Morocco don't know how many wives he has, but thinks he has five, five hundred. However, that is near enough, a dozen or so, one way or the other, don't matter. Even the Jews in the interior have a plurality of wives. I have caught a glimpse of the faces of several Moorish women, for they are only human and will expose their faces for the admiration of a Christian dog when no male Moor is by. And I am full of veneration for the wisdom that leads them to cover up such atrocious ugliness. They carry their children at their backs in a sack, like other savages the world over. Many of the Negroes are held in slavery by the Moors, but the moment a female slave becomes her master's concubine, her bonds are broken, and as soon as a male slave can read the first chapter of the Koran, which contains the creed, he can no longer be held in bondage. They have three Sundays a week in Tangier. The Muhammadans comes Friday, the Jews on Saturday, and that of the Christian consuls on Sunday. The Jews are the most radical. The Moor goes to his mosque about noon on his Sabbath, as on any other day, removes his shoes at the door, performs his ablutions, makes his salams, pressing his forehead to the pavement time and again, says his prayers, and goes back to his work. But the Jew shuts up shop, will not cut, touch copper or bronze money at all, soils his fingers with nothing meaner than silver and gold, attends the synagogue devoutly, will not cook or have anything to do with fire, and religiously refrains from embarking in any enterprise. The Moor, who has made a pilgrimage to Mecca, is entitled to high distinction. Men call him Haji, and he is thenceforward a great personage. Hundreds of Moors come to Tangier every year and embark for Mecca. They go part of the way in English steamers, and the ten or twelve dollars they pay for passage is about all the trip costs. They take with them a quantity of food, and when the commissary department fails, they skirmish, as Jack terms it in his sinful, slangy way, from the time they leave till the time they get home. They never wash, either on land or sea. They are usually gone from five to seven months, and as they do not change their clothes during all that time, they are totally unfit for the drawing room when they get back. Many of them have to rake and scrape a long time to gather together the ten dollars their steamer passage costs, and when one of them gets back, he is a bankrupt forever after. Few Moors can ever build up their fortunes again in one short lifetime after so reckless an outlay. In order to confine the dignity of Haji to gentlemen of patrician blood and possessions, the emperor de decreed that no man should make the pilgrimage save bloated aristocrats who were worth a hundred dollars in specie. 
But behold, how iniquity can circumvent the law. For a consideration, the Jewish Jewish money changer lends the pilgrim one hundred dollars long enough for him to swear himself through, and then receives it back before the ship sails out of the harbor. Spain is the only nation the Moors fear. The reason is that Spain sends her heaviest ships of war and her loudest guns to astonish the Muslims. While America and other nations send only a little contemptible tub of a gunboat occasionally, the Moors, like other savages, learn by what they see, not by what they hear or read. We have great fleets in the Mediterranean, but they seldom touch at African ports. The Moors have a small opinion of England, France, and America, and put their representatives to a deal of red tape circumlocution before they grant them their common rights, let alone a favor. But the moment the Spanish minister makes a demand, it is acceded to at once, whether it be just or not. Spain chastised the Moors five or six years ago about a disputed piece of property opposite Gibraltar and captured the city of Tetuan, she comprised on an uh, compromised on an augmentation of her territory, twenty seven million dollars in indemnity money and peace, and then she gave up the city, but she never gave it up until the Spanish soldiers had eaten up all the cats. They would not compromise as long as the cats held out. Spaniards are very fond of cats, on the contrary, the Moors reverence cats as something sacred so the Spaniards touched them on a tender point that time. Their unfeline conduct in eating up all the Tatuan cats aroused a hatred toward them in the breasts of the Moors, to which even the driving them out of Spain was tame and passionless. Moors and Spaniards are foes forever now. France had a minister here once who embittered the nation against him in the most innocent way. He killed a couple of battalions of cats, Tangier is full of them, and made a parlor carpet out of their hides. He made his carpet in circles, first a circle of old gray tomcats with their tails all pointing toward the center, then a circle of yellow cats, next a circle of black cats and a circle of white ones, then a circle of all sorts of cats, and finally a centerpiece of assorted kittens. It was very beautiful, but the Boers curse his memory to this day. When we went to call on our American Consul General today, I noticed that all possible games for parlor amusement seemed to be represented on his center table. I thought that hinted at lonesomeness. The idea was correct. His is the only American family in Tangier. There are many foreign consuls in this place, but much visiting is not indulged in. Tangier is clear out of the world, and what is the use of visiting when people have nothing on earth to talk about? There is none, so each consul's family stays at home chiefly and amuses itself as best it can. Tangier is full of interest for one day, but after that it is a weary prison. The Consul General has been here five years and has got enough of it to do him for a century and is going home shortly. His family sees upon their letters and papers when the mail arrives, read them over and over again for two days or three, talk them over and over again for two or three more till they wear them out. And after that, for days together, they eat and drink and sleep and ride out over the same old road and see the same old tiresome things that even decades or centuries have scarcely changed and say never a single word. They have literally nothing whatever to talk about. The arrival of an American man of war is a godsend to them. Oh, solitude! Where are the charms which sages have seen in thy face? It is the completest exile that I can conceive of. I would seriously recommend to the government of the United States 
that when a man commits a crime so heinous that the law provides no adequate punishment for it, they make him consul general to Tangier. I am glad to have seen Tangier, the second oldest town in the world, but I am ready to bid it goodbye, I believe. We shall go hence to Gibraltar this evening or in the morning, and doubtless the Quaker city will sail from that port within the next 48 hours. Chapter 10 We passed the 4th of July on board the Quaker city in mid-ocean. It was in all respects a characteristic Mediterranean day, faultlessly beautiful, a cloudless sky, a refreshing summer wind, a radiant sunshine that glinted cheerfully and dan from dancing wavelets instead of crested mountains of water, a sea beneath us that was so wonderfully blue, so richly, brilliantly blue that it overcame the dullest sensibilities with the spell of its fascination. They even have fine sunsets on the Mediterranean, a thing that is certainly rare in most quarters of the globe. The evening we sailed away from Gibraltar, that hard-featured rock was swimming in a creamy mist so rich, so soft, so enchantingly vague and dreamy, that even the oracle, that serene, that inspired, that overpowering humbug, scorned the dinner gong and tarried to worship. He said, Well, that's gorgeous, ain't it? They don't have none of them things in our parts, do they? I consider that them effects is on account of the superior refragibility, as you may say, of the sun's dynamic combination with the lymphatic forces of the perihelion of Jupiter. What should you think? Oh, go to bed. Dan said that and went away. Oh, yes, it's all very well to say to go to bed when a man makes an argument which another man can't answer. Dan don't never stand any chance in an argument with me, and he knows it, too. What should you say, Jack? Now, Doctor, don't you go, don't you come bothering around me with that dictionary, Bosch. I, I don't do you any harm, do I? You let me alone. He's gone, too. Well, them fellows have all tackled the old oracle, as they say, but the old man's most too many for him. Maybe the poet Lariat ain't satisfied with them deductions. The poet replied with a barbarous rhyme and went below. <clears throat> Pairs that he can't qualify neither. Well, I didn't expect nothing out of him. I never seen one of them poets yet that knowed anything. He'll go down now and grind out about four reams of the awfulest slush about that old rock and give it to a consul or a pirate pilot or a nigger, or anybody he comes across first, which he can't impose on. Pity but somebody take that poor old lunatic and dig all that poetry rubbish out of him. Why can't a man put his intellect onto things that some value? Gibbons and Hippocrates and Sarcophagus, all them old ancient philosophers was down on poets. Doctor, I said, you are going to invent authorities now, and I'll leave you to... I always enjoy your conversation, notwithstanding the luxuriance of your syllables, but when the philosophy you offer rests on your own responsibility. But when you begin to soar, when you begin to support it with the evidence of authorities who are creations of your own fancy, I lose confidence. That was the way to flatter the doctor. He considered it a sort of acknowledgment on my part of a fear to argue with him. He was always persecuting the passengers with abstruse propositions framed in language that no man could understand, and they endured the exquisite, exquisite torture a minute or two and then abandoned the field. A triumph like this over half a dozen antagonists was sufficient for one day. From that time forward he would patrol the decks beaming blandly upon all comers, and so tranquilly, blissfully happy. But I digress. The thunder of our two brave cannon announced the 4th of July at daylight to all who were awake. But many of us got on our, got our information at a later hour from the almanac. 
All the flags were sent aloft except half a dozen that were needed to decorate portions of the ship below, and in a short time the vessel assumed a holiday appearance. During the morning, meetings were held and all manner of committees set to work on the celebration ceremonies. In the afternoon, the ship's company assembled aft, on deck, under the awnings. The flute, the asthmatic, asthmatic melodeon, and the consumptive clarinet crippled the star-spangled banner. The choir chased it to cover, and George came in with a peculiarly lacerating screech on the final note and slaughtered it. Nobody mourned. We carried out the corpse on three cheers. That joke was not intentional, and I do not endorse it. And then the president, throned behind a cable locker with a national flag spread over it, announced the reader who rose up and read the same old declaration of independence which we have all listened to so often without paying any attention to what it said. And after that, the president piped up, piped the order of the day to quarters, and he made that same old speech about our national greatness, which we so religiously believe and so fervently applaud. Now came the choir into court again, with the complaining instruments, and assaulted, Hail Columbia. And when victory hung wavering in the scale, George returned with his dreadful wild goose stop turned on, and the choir won, of course. A minister pronounced the benediction, and the patriotic little gathering disbanded. The 4th of July was safe, as far as the Mediterranean was concerned. At dinner in the evening, a well-written original poem was recited with spirit by one of the ship's captains, and thirteen regular toasts were washed down with several baskets of champagne. The speeches were bad, execrable almost without exception. In fact, without any exception but one, Captain Duncan made a good speech. He made the only good speech of the evening. He said, Ladies and gentlemen, may we all live to a green old age and be prosperous and happy. Steward, bring up another basket of champagne. It was regarded as a very able effort. The festivities, so to speak, closed with another of those miraculous balls on the promenade deck. We were not used to dancing on an even keel, though, and it was only a questionable success. But take it all together, it was a bright, cheerful, pleasant fourth. Toward nightfall the next evening, we steamed into the great artificial harbor of this noble city of Marseille and saw the dying sunlight gild its clustering, clus, clustering spires and ramparts and flood its leagues of environing verdure over a, with a mellow radiance that touched with an added charm the wide villas that flecked the landscape far and near. There were no stages out, and we could not get on the pier from the ship. It was annoying. We were full of enthusiasm. We wanted to see France. Just at nightfall, our party of three contracted, contracted with a waterman for the privilege of using his boat as a bridge. Its stern was at our companion ladder, and its bow touched the pier. We got in, and the fellow backed out into the harbor. I told him in French that all we wanted was to walk over his thwarts and step ashore, and asked him what he went away out there for. He said he could not understand me. I repeated. Still, he could not understand. He appeared to be very ignorant of French. The doctor tried him, but we could not understand. He could not understand the doctor. I asked this boatman to explain his conduct, which he did, and then I couldn't understand him. Dan said, Oh, go to the pier, you old fool. That's what we want to go. We reasoned calmly with Dan that it was useless to speak to this foreigner in English, that he had better let us conduct this business in the French language and not let the stranger see how uncultivated he was. Well, go on, go on, he said. Don't mind me. I don't wish to interfere. Only, if you go on telling him in your kind of French, he will never find out where we want to go. That is what I think about it. 
We rebuked him severely for this remark, and said we never knew an ignorant person, yet but was prejudiced. The Frenchman spoke again, and the doctor said, There now, Dan. He says he is going to a laise to the Duane. Means he's going to go to the hotel. Oh, certainly, we don't know the French language. This was a crusher, as Jack would say. It silenced further criticism from the disaffected member. We coasted past the sharp bows of a navy of great steamships and stopped at last at a government building on a stone pier. It was easy to remember then that the Duane was the custom house and not the hotel. We did not mention it, however. With winning French politeness, the officers merely opened and closed our satchels, declined to examine our passports, and sent us on our way. We stopped at the first cafe we came to and entered. An old woman seated us at a table and waited for orders. The doctor said, Avez-vous du vin? The dame looked perplexed. The doctor said again, with elaborate distinctness of articulation, Avez-vous du vin? The dame looked more perplexed than before. I said, Doctor, there is a flaw in your pronunciation somewhere. Let me try her. Madame, avez-vous du vin? It isn't any use, doctor. Take the witness. Madame, avez-vous du vin, du fromage, pine, pickled pig's feet, buer, du oafs, du boeuf, horseradish, sauerkraut, hog and hominy, anything, anything in the world that can stay a Christian stomach? She said, Bless you, why didn't you speak English before? I don't know anything about your plagued French. The humiliating taunts of the disaffected member spoiled the supper, and we dispatched it in angry silence and got away as soon as we could. Here we were in beautiful France, in a vast stone house of quaint architecture, surrounded by all manner of curiously worded French signs stared at by strangely habited, bearded French people, everything gradually and surely forcing upon us the coveted consciousness that at last, and beyond all question, we were in beautiful France, and absorbing its nature to the forgetfulness of everything else, and coming to feel the happy romance of the thing, in all its enchanting delightfulness, and to think of this skinny veteran intruding with her vile English at such a moment to blow the fair vision to the winds. It was exasperating. We set out to find the center of the city, inquiring the direction every now and again. We never did succeed in making anybody understand just exactly what we wanted, and neither did we ever succeed in comprehending just exactly what they said in reply. But then they always pointed, they always did that, and we bowed and politely and said, Merci, monsieur. And so it was a blighting triumph over the, over the disaffected member anyway. He was restive under these victories and often asked, What did that pirate say? Why, he told us which way to go to find the Grand Casino. Yes, but what did he say? Oh, it don't matter what he said, we understood him. These are educated people, not like that absurd boatman. Well, I wish they were educated enough to tell a man a direction that goes somewhere, for we've been going around in a circle for an hour. I've passed this same old drugstore seven times. We said it was a low, disreputable falsehood, but we knew it was not. It was plain that it would not do to pass that drugstore again, though. We might go on asking directions, but we must cease from following finger pointings if we hope to check the suspicions of the disaffected member. A long walk through smooth, asphalt and paved streets, bordered by blocks of vast new mercantile houses of cream-colored stone, every house and every block precisely like all the other houses and all the other blocks for a mile, and all brilliantly lighted, brought us at last to the principal thoroughfare. On every hand were bright colors, flashing constellations of gas burners, 
gaily dressed men and women thronging the sidewalks. Hurry, life, activity, cheerfulness, conversation, and laughter everywhere. We found the Grand Hotel du Louvre et la Paix and wrote down who we were, where we were born, what our occupations were, the place we came from last, whether we were married or single, how we liked it, how old we were, where we were bound for, and when we expected to get there, and a great deal of information of similar importance, all for the benefit of the landlord and the secret police. We hired a guide and began the business of sightseeing immediately. That first night on French soil was a stirring one. I cannot think of half the places we went to or what we particularly saw. We had no disposition to examine carefully into anything at all. We only wanted to glance and go, to move, keep moving. The spirit of the country was upon us. We sat down, finally, at a late hour, in the great casino and called for unstinted champagne. It is so easy to be bloated aristocrats where it costs nothing of consequence. There were about five hundred people in that dazzling place, I suppose, though the walls being papered entirely with mirrors, so to speak. One could not really tell, but that there were a hundred thousand. Young, daintily dressed exquisites, and young, stylishly dressed women, and also old gentlemen and old ladies, sat in couples and groups about innumerable marble-topped tables, and ate fancy suppers, drank wine, and kept up a chattering din of conversation that was dazing to the senses. There was a stage at the far end, and a large orchestra, and every now and then actors and actresses in preposterous comic dresses came out and sang the most extravagantly funny songs, to judge by their absurd actions. But that audience merely suspended its chatter, stared cynically, and never once smiled, never once applauded. I had always thought that Frenchmen were ready to laugh at anything. Chapter 11 We are getting foreignized rapidly and with facility. We are getting reconciled to halls and bedchambers with unhomelike stone floors and no carpets. Floors that ring to the tread of one's heels with a sharpness that is death to sentimental musing. We are getting used to tidy, tidy, noiseless waiters who glide hither and thither and hover about your back and your elbows like butterflies, quick to comprehend orders, quick to fill them, thankful for a gratuity without regard to the amount, and always polite, never otherwise than polite. That is the strangest curiosity yet, a really polite hotel waiter who isn't an idiot. We are getting used to driving right into the central court of the hotel, in the midst of a fragrant circle of vines and flowers, and in the midst also of parties of gentlemen sitting quietly reading the paper and smoking. We are getting used to ice frozen by artificial process in ordinary bottles, the only kind of ice they have here. We are getting used to all these things, but we are not getting used to carrying our own soap. We are sufficiently civilized to carry our own combs and toothbrushes. But this thing of having to ring for soap every time we wash is new to us and not pleasant at all. We think of it just after we get our heads and faces thoroughly wet, or just when we think we have been in the bathtub long enough, and then, of course, an annoying delay follows. The Marseillaise make Marseille hymns and Marseille vests and Marseille soap for all the world. But they never sing their hymns or wear their vests or wash with their soap themselves. We have learned to go through the lingering routine of the table d'hote with patience, with serenity, with satisfaction. We take soup, then wait a few minutes for the fish. A few minutes more for the plates are changed, and the, then the roast becomes beef. Uh, the roast beef comes. Another change, and we take peas. Change again, and take lentils. Change, and take snail pâtés. 
I prefer grasshoppers. Change and take roast chicken and salad. Then strawberry pie and ice cream. Then green figs, pears, oranges, green almonds, etc. Finally, coffee. Wine with every course, of course, being in France. With such a cargo on board, digestion is a slow process. And we must sit long in the cool chambers and smoke. And read French newspapers, which have a strange fashion of telling a perfectly straight story till you get to the nub of it. And then a word drops in that no man can translate, and that story is ruined. An embankment fell on some Frenchman yesterday, and the papers are full of it today. But whether, whether those sufferers were killed or crippled or bruised or only scared is more than I can possibly make out. And yet I would give just anything to know. We were troubled a little at dinner today by the conduct of an American who talked very loudly and coarsely and laughed boisterously where all others were so quiet and well behaved. He ordered wine with a royal flourish and said, I never dine without wine, sir, which was a pitiful falsehood, and looked upon the company to bask in the admiration he expected to find in their faces. All these heirs in a land where they would as soon expect to leave the soup out of the bill of fare as the wine. In a land where wine is nearly as common among all ranks as water. This fellow said, I am a free-born sovereign, sir, an American, sir, and I want everyone to know it. He did not mention that he was a lineal descent of Balaam's ass, but everybody knew that without his telling. We have driven in the Prado, that superb avenue bordered with patrician mansions and noble shade trees, and have visited the Chateau Borley and its curious museum. They showed us a miniature cemetery there, a copy of the first graveyard that was ever in Marseille, Marseille no doubt. The delicate little skeletons were lying in broken vaults and had their household gods and kitchen utensils with them. The original of this cemetery was dug up in the principal street of the city a few years ago. It had remained there, only twelve feet underground, for a matter of twenty-five hundred years or thereabouts. Romulus was here before he built Rome and thought something of founding a city on this spot, but gave up the idea. He may have been personally acquainted with some of these Phoenicians whose skeletons we have been examining. In the great zoological gardens, we found specimens of all the animals the world produces, I think, including a dromedary, a monkey ornamented with tufts of brilliant blue and carmine hair, a very gorgeous monkey he was, a hippopotamus from the Nile, and a sort of tall, long-legged bird with a beak like a powder horn and close-fitting wings like the tails of a dress coat. This fellow stood up with his eyes shut and his shoulders stooped forward a little and looked as if he had his hands under his coat tails. Such tranquil stupidity, such supernatural gravity, such self-righteousness and such ineffable self-complacency were in the countenance and attitude of that gray-bodied, dark-winged, bald-headed, and preposterously uncomely bird. He was so un ungainly, so pimply about the head, so scaly about the legs, yet so serene, so unspeakably satisfied. He was the most comical-looking creature that can be imagined. It was good to hear Dan and the doctor laugh. Such natural and such enjoyable laughter had not been heard among our excursionists since our ship sailed away from America. This bird was a godsend to us, and I should be an ingrate if I forgot to make honorable mention of him in these pages. Ours was a pleasure excursion. Therefore, we stayed with that bird an hour and made the most of him. We stirred him up occasionally, but he only unclosed an eye and slowly closed it again, abating no jot of his stately piety of demeanor or his tremendous seriousness. He only seemed to say, Defile not, heaven's anointed, with unsanctified hands. We did not know his name, and so we called him the Pilgrim, 
Dan said. All he wants now is a Plymouth collection. The boon companion of the colossal elephant was a common cat. This cat had a fashion of climbing up the elephant's hind legs and roosting on his back. She would sit up there with her paws curved under her breast and sleep in the sun half the afternoon. It used to annoy the elephant at first, and he would reach up and take her down, but she would go aft and climb up again. She persisted until she finally conquered the elephant's prejudices, and now they are inseparable friends. The cat plays about her comrade's forefeet or his trunk often until dogs approach, and then she goes aloft out of danger. The elephant has annihilated several dogs lately that pressed his companion too closely. We hired a sailboat and a guide and made an excursion to one of the small islands in the harbor to visit the Castle Deef. This ancient fortress has a melancholy history. It has been used as a prison for political offenders for two or three hundred years and its dungeon walls are scarred with the rudely carved names of many and many a captive who fretted his life away here and left no record of himself but these sad epitaphs wrought with his own hand. How thick the names were, and their long-departed owners seemed to throng the gloomy cells and corridors with their phantom shapes. We loitered through dungeon after dungeon, away down into the living rock below the level of the sea, it seemed. Names everywhere, some plebeian, some noble, some even princely. Plebeian, prince, and noble had one solicitude in common. They would not be forgotten. They could suffer solitude, inactivity, and the horrors of a silence that no sound ever disturbed. But they could not bear the thought of being utterly forgotten by the world. Hence the carved carved names. In one cell, where a little light penetrated, a man had lived twenty-seven years without seeing the face of a human being, lived in filth and wretchedness with no companionship but his own thoughts, and they were sorrowful enough and hopeless enough, no doubt. Whatever his jailers considered that he needed was conveyed by his to his cell by night through a wicket. This man carved the walls of his prison house from floor to roof with all manner of figures of men and animals grouped in intricate designs. He had toiled there year after year at his self-appointed task, while infants grew to boyhood, to vigorous youth, idled through school and college, acquired a profession, claimed man's mature estate, married and looked back to infancy as a thing of some vague, ancient time, almost. But who shall tell how many ages it seemed to this prisoner? With the one, time flew sometimes. With the other, never. It crawled always. To one, night spent in dancing had seemed made of minutes instead of hours. To the other, those self-same nights had been like all other nights of dungeon life, and seemed made of slow, dragging weeks instead of hours and minutes. One prisoner of fifteen years had scratched verses upon his walls and brief prose sentences, brief but full of pathos. These spoke not of himself and his hard estate, but only of the shrine where his spirit fled the prison to worship, of home and the idols that were templed there. He never lived to see them. The walls of these dungeons are as thick as some bedchambers at home are wide, fifteen feet. We saw the damp, dismal cells in which two of Dumas' heroes passed their confinement, heroes of Monte Cristo. It was here that brave Abbey wrote a book with his own blood, with a pen made of a piece of iron hoop and by the light of a lamp made out of shreds of cloth soaked in grease obtained from his food, and then dug through the thick wall with some trifling instrument which he wrought himself out of a piece of stray iron or table cutlery, and freed Dantes from his chains. It was a pity that so many weeks of dreary labor should have come to naught at last. 
They showed us the noisome cell where the celebrated iron mask, that ill-starred brother of a hard-hearted king of France, was confined for a season before he was sent to hide the strange mystery of his life from the curious in the dungeons of St. Marguerite. The place had a far greater interest for us than it could have if we had known beyond all question who the Iron Mask was, and what his history had been, and why this most unusual punishment, punishment had been meted out to him. Mystery, that was the charm, that speechless tongue, those prisoned features, that heart so frighted with unspoken troubles, and that breast so oppressed with its piteous secret had been there. These dank walls had known the man whose dolorous story is, uh, is a sealed book forever. There was a fascination in the spot. Chapter 12 We have come five hundred miles by rail through the heart of France. What a bewitching land it is. What a garden. Surely the leagues of bright green lawns are swept and brushed and watered every day, and their grasses trimmed by the barber. Surely the hedges are shaped and measured in their, and their symmetry preserved by the most architectural of gardeners. Surely the long, straight rows of straight, stately poplars that divide the beautiful landscape like the squares of a checkerboard are set with line and plummet, and their uniform height, height determined with a spirit level. Surely the straight, smooth, white, pure white turnpikes are jack-planed and sandpapered every day. How else are these marvels of symmetry, cleanliness, and order attained? It is wonderful. There are no unsightly stone walls and never a fence of any kind. There is no dirt, no decay, no rubbish anywhere. Nothing that even hints at untidiness. Nothing that ever suggests neglect. All is orderly and beautiful. Everything is charming to the eye. We had such glimpses of the Rhone during gliding along between its grassy banks of cozy cottages buried in flowers and shrubbery, of quaint old red-tiled villages with mossy medieval cathedrals looming out of their midst, of wooded hills with ivy-grown towers and turrets of feudal castles projecting above the foliage. Such glimpses of paradise it seemed to us such visions of fabled fairyland. We knew then what the poet meant when he sang of Thy cornfields green and sunny vines, O pleasant lands of France. And it is a pleasant land. No word describes it so felicitously as that one. They say there is no word for home in the French language. Well, considering that they have the article itself in such an attractive aspect, they ought to manage to get along without the word. Let us not waste too much pity on homeless France. I have observed that Frenchmen abroad seldom wholly give up the idea of going back to France some time or other. I am not surprised at it now. We are not infatuated with these French railway cars, though we took first-class passage, not because we wished to attract attention by doing a thing which is uncommon in Europe, but because we could make our journey quicker by doing so. It is hard to make railroading pleasant in any country. It is too tedious. Stage coaching is infinitely more delightful. Once I crossed the plains and deserts and mountains of the west in a stagecoach from the Missouri line to California, and since then all my pleasure trips have must be measured to that rare holiday frolic. Two thousand miles of ceaseless rush and rattle and clatter by night and by day, and never a weary moment, never a lapse of interest. The first seven hundred miles a level continent 
its grassy carpet greener and softer and smoother than any sea and figured with designs fitted to its magnitude. The shadows of the clouds. Here were no scenes but summer scenes, and no disposition inspired by them, but to lie at full length on the male sacks in the grateful breeze, and dreamily smoke the pipe of peace. What other? Where all was repose and contentment. In cool mornings, before the sun was fairly up, it was worth a lifetime of city toiling and moiling to perch in the foretop with the driver and see the six Mustangs scamper under the sharp snapping of the whip that never touched them, to scan the blue distances of a world that knew no lords but us to cleave the wind with uncovered head and feel the sluggish, pul sluggish pulses rousing to the spirit of a speed that pretended to the resistless rush of a typhoon. Then, thirteen hundred miles of desert solitudes, of limitless, limitless panoramas of bewildering perspective, of mimic cities, of pinnacled cathedrals, of massive fortresses, counterfeited in the eternal rocks and splendid with the crimson and gold of the setting sun, of dizzy altitudes among fog-weathered peaks and never-melting snows, where thunders and lightnings and tempests warred magnificently at our feet and the storm clouds above swung their shredded banners in our very faces. But I forgot, I am in elegant France now, and not scurrying through the great south past and the wind river mountains among antelopes and buffaloes and painted indians on the war path it is not meet that i should make two disparaging comparisons between humdrum travel on a railway and that royal summer flight across a continent in a stagecoach i meant in the beginning to say that railway journeying is tedious and tiresome and so it is though at the time I was thinking particularly of a dismal fifty-hour pilgrimage between New York and St. Louis. Of course, our trip through France was not really tedious, because all its scenes and experiences were new and strange. But as Dan says, it had its discrepancies. The cars are built in compartments that hold eight persons each. Each compartment is partially subdivided, and so there are two toler tolerably distinct parties of four in it. Four face the other four. The seats and backs are thickly padded and cushioned and are very comfortable. You can smoke if you wish. There are no bothersome peddlers. You are saved the infliction of a multitude of disagreeable fellow passengers. So far, so well. But then the conductor locks you in when the train starts. There is no water to drink in the car. There is no heating apparatus for night travel. If a drunken rowdy should get in, you could not remove a matter of twenty seats from him or enter another car. But above all, if you are worn out and must sleep, you must sit up and do it in naps with cramped legs and in a torturing misery that leaves you withered and lifeless the next day. For behold, they have not that culmination of all charity and human kindness, a sleeping car, in all France. I prefer the American system. It has not so many grievous discrepancies. In France, all is clockwork, all is order. They make no mistakes. Every third man wears a uniform, and whether he be a marshal of the empire or a brakeman, he is ready and perfectly willing to answer all your questions with tireless politeness, ready to tell you which car to take, yea, and ready to go and put you into it to make sure that you shall not go astray. You cannot pass into the waiting room of the depot till you have secured your ticket, and you cannot pass from its only exit till the train is at, it, at its threshold to receive you. Once on board, the train will not start till your ticket has been examined, till every passenger's ticket has been inspected. That is chiefly for your own good. If by any possibility you have managed to take the wrong train, 
you will be handed over to a polite official who will take you whither you belong and bestow you with many an affable bow. Your ticket will be inspected every now and then along the route, and when it is time to change cars, you will know it. You are in the hands of officials who zealously study your welfare and your interest, instead of turning their talents to the invention of new methods of discommoding and snubbing you. As is very often the main employment of that exceedingly self-satisfied monarch, the radio railroad conductor of America, but the happiest regulation in French railway government is 30 minutes to dinner, no five-minute boltings of flabby rolls, muddy coffee, questionable eggs, gouda percha beef, and pies whose conception and execution are a dark and bloody mystery to all save the cook that created them. No, we sat calmly down. It was in old Dijon, which is so easy to spell and so impossible to pronounce except when you civilize it and call it Demijohn, and poured out rich Burgundian wines and munched calmly through a long ta table de haute, bill of fare, snail patties, delicious fruits and all, then paid the trifle it cost and stepped happily aboard the train again, without once cursing the railroad company. A rare experience, and one to be treasured forever. They say they do not have accidents on these French roads, and I think it must be true. If I remember rightly, we passed about wagon roads or through tunnels under them, but never crossed them on their own level. About every quarter of a mile, it seemed to me, a man came out and held up a club till the train went by, to signify that everything was safe ahead. Switches were changed a mile in advance by pulling a wire rope that passed along the ground by the rail from station to station. Signals for the day and signals for the night gave constant and timely notice of the position of switches. No, they have no railroad accidents to speak of in France. But why? Because when one occurs, somebody has to hang for it. Not hang, maybe but be punished at least with such vigor for such vigor of emphasis as to make negligence a thing to be shuddered at by railroad officials for many a day thereafter. No blame attached to the officers, that lying and disaster-breeding verdict so common to our soft-hearted juries is seldom rendered in France. If the trouble occurred in the conductor's department, that officer must suffer his if his Subordinate cannot be proven guilty. If, in the engineer's department, and the case be similar, the engineer must answer. The old travelers, those delightful parrots who have been here before, and know more about the country than Louis Na Louis Napoleon knows now or ever will know, tell us these things, and we believe them because they are pleasant things to believe, and because they are plausible and savor of the rigid subjection to law and order which we behold about us everywhere. But we love the old travelers. We love to hear them prate and drivel and lie. We can tell them the moment we see them. They always throw out a few feelers. They never cast themselves adrift till they have sounded every individual and know that he has not traveled. Then they open their throttle valves and how they do brag and sneer and swell and soar and blaspheme the sacred name of truth. Their central idea, their grand aim, is to subjugate you, keep you down, make you feel insignificant and humble in the blaze of their cosmopolitan glory. They will not let you know anything. They sneer at your most inoffensive suggestions. They laugh unfeelingly at your treasured dreams of foreign lands. They brand the statements of your traveled aunts and uncles as the stupidest absurdities. They deride your most trusted authors and demolish the fair images they have set up for your willing worship with the pitiless ferocity of the fanatic iconoclast. But still, I love the old travelers. I love them for their witless platitudes, for their supernatural ability to bore, for their delightful and asinine vanity, for their luxuriant fertility of imagination, 
for their startling, their brilliant, their overwhelming mendacity. By Lyon and the Seine, where we were, where we saw the Lady of Lyon and thought little of her comeliness. By Via Franca, Tonnerre, Venerable Sens, Melun, Fontainebleau, and scores of other beautiful cities, we swept, always noting the absence of hog wallows, broken fences, cow lots, unpainted houses, and mud, and always noting as well the presence of cleanliness, grace. Taste in adorning and beautifying, even to the disposition of a tree or the turning of a hedge. The marvel of roads in perfect repair, void of ruts and guiltless of even an inequality of surface. We bowled along, hour after hour, that brilliant summer day, and as nightfall approached we entered a wilderness of odorous flowers and shrubbery, sped through it, then, excited and delighted and half-persuaded that we were only the sport of a beautiful dream, lo, we stood in magnificent Paris. What excellent order they kept about that vast depot. There was no frantic crowding and jostling, no shouting and swearing, and no swaggering intrusion of services by rowdy hackmen. These later gentry stood outside, stood quietly by their long line of vehicles and said never a word. A kind of hackman general seemed to have the whole matter of transportation in his hands. He politely received the passengers and ushered them to the kind of conveyance they wanted and told the driver where to deliver them. There was no talking back, no dissatisfaction about overcharging, no grumbling about anything. In a little while we were speeding through the streets of Paris and delightfully recognizing certain names and places which books had long ago made us familiar. It was like meeting an old friend when we read Rue de Rivoli on the street corner. We knew the genuine, vast palace of the Louvre was as well as we knew its picture. When we passed by the Column of July, we needed no one to tell us what it was or to remind us that on its site once stood the grim Bastille, that grave of human hopes and happiness, that dismal prison house within, whose, that br dismal prison house within whose dungeons so many young faces put on the wrinkles of age, so many proud spirits grew humble, so many brave hearts broke. We secured rooms at the hotel, or rather, we had three beds put into one room so that we might be together, and then we went out to a restaurant just after lamplighting and ate a comfortable, satisfactory, lingering dinner. It was a pleasure to eat where everything was so tidy, the food was so well cooked, the waiters so polite, and the coming and departing company so mustached, so frisky, so affable so fearfully and wonderfully Frenchy. All the surroundings were gay and enlivening. Two hundred people sat at little tables on the sidewalk, sipping wine and coffee. The streets were thronged with light vehicles and joyous pleasure seekers. There was music in the air, life and action all about us, and a conflagration of gaslight everywhere. After dinner, we felt like seeing such Parisian specialties as we might see without distressing exer exertion, and so we sauntered through the brilliant streets and looked at the dainty trifles in various variety stores and jewelry shops. Occasionally, merely for the pleasure of being cruel, we put unoffending Frenchmen on the rack with questions framed in the incomprehensible jargon of their native language, and while they writhed, we impaled them. We peppered them, we scarified them with their own vile verbs and participles. We noticed that in the jewelry stores they had some of the articles marked gold and some labeled imitation. We wondered at this extravagance of honesty and inquired into the matter. We were informed that inasmuch as most people are not able to tell false gold from the genuine article, the government compels jewelers to have their gold work assayed and stamped officially according to its fineness, and their imitation work duly labeled with the sign of its falsity. 
They told us the jewelers would not dare to violate this law and that whatever a stranger bought in one of their stores might be depended upon as being strictly what it was represented to be. Veritably a wonderful land is France. Then we hunted for a barber shop. From earliest infancy it had been a cherished ambition of mine to be shaved some day in a palatial barber shop in Paris. I wished to recline at full length in a cushioned invalid chair with pictures about me and sumptuous furniture, with frescoed walls and gilded arches above me, and vistas of Corinthian columns stretching far before me, with perfumes of Araby to intoxicate my senses, and the slumberous drone of distant noises to soothe me to sleep. At the end of an hour, I would wake up regretfully and find my face as smooth and as soft as an infant's. Departing, I would lift my hands above that barber's head and say, Heaven bless you, my son. So we searched high and low for a matter of two hours, but never a barber shop could we see. We saw only wig-making establishments with shocks of dead and repulsive hair bound upon the heads of painted waxen brigands who stared out from glass boxes upon the passerby with their stony eyes and scared him with the ghostly white of their countenances. We shunned these signs for a time, but finally we concluded that the wig makers must of necessity be the barbers as well, since we could find no single legitimate representative of the fraternity. We entered and asked, and found that it was even so. I said I wanted to be shaved, the barber inquired where my room was. I said, never mind where my room was. I wanted to be shaved there on the spot. The doctor said he would be shaved also. Then there was an excitement among those two barbers. There was a wild consultation and afterwards a hurrying to and fro and a feverish gathering up of razors from obscure places and a ransacking for soap. Next, they took us into a little mean, shabby back room they got two ordinary sitting-room chairs and placed us in them with our coats on. My old, old dream of bliss vanished into thin air. I sat bolt upright, silent, sad, and solemn. One of the wig-making villains lathered my face for ten terrible minutes and finished by plastering a mass of suds into my mouth. I expelled the nasty stuff with a strong English expletive and said, Foreigner, beware! Then this outlaw strapped his razor on his boot, hovered over me ominously for six fearful seconds, then swooped down upon me like the genius of destruction. The first rake of his razor loosened the very hide from my face and lifted me out of the chair. I stormed and raved, and the other boys enjoyed it. Their beards are not strong and thick, let us draw the curtain over this harrowing scene. Suffice it that I submitted and went through with the cruel infliction of a shave by a French barber. Tears of exquisite agony coursed down my cheeks now and then, but I survived. Then the incipient assassin held a basin of water under my chin and slopped its contents over my face and into my bosom and down the back of my neck with a mean pretense of washing away the soap and blood. He dried my features with a towel and was going to comb my hair, but I asked to be excused. I said, with withering irony, that it was sufficient to be skinned. I declined to be scalped. I went away from there with my handkerchief about my face and never, never, never desired to dream of palatial Parisian barbershops any more. The truth is, as I believe I have since found out, that they have no barber shops worthy of the name in Paris, and no barbers either, for that matter. The impostor who does duty as a barber brings his pans and napkins and implements of torture to your residence and deliberately skins you in your private apartments. Ah, I have suffered, suffered, suffered here in Paris, but never mind. The time is coming when I shall have a dark and bloody revenge. Some day a Parisian barber will come to my room to skin me, and from that day forth that barber will never be heard from any more. At eleven o'clock we alighted upon a sign which manifestly referred to billiards, 
joy. We had played billiards in the Azores with balls that were not round, and on an ancient table that was very little smoother than a brick pavement. One of those wretched old things with dead cushions, with patches in the faded cloth and invisible obstructions that made the balls describe the most astonishing and unsuspected angles and perform feats in the way of unlooked for and almost impossible scratches that they were perfectly bewildering. We had played at Gibraltar with balls the size of a walnut on a table like a public square, and in both instances we achieved far more aggravation than amusement. We expected to fare better here, but we were mistaken. The cushions were a good deal higher than the balls, and in the balls, and as the balls had a fashion of always stopping under the cushions, we accomplished very little in the way of caroms. The cushions were hard and unelastic, and the cues were so crooked that in making a shot you had to allow for the curve or you would infallibly put the English on the wrong side of the ball. Dan was to mark while the doctor and I played. At the end of an hour, neither of us had made a count, and so Dan was tired of keeping tally with nothing to tally, and we were heated and angry and disgusted. We paid the heavy bill, about six cents and said we would call around sometime when we had a week to spend and finish the game. We adjourned to one of those pretty cafes and took supper and tested the, tested the wines of the country, as we had been instructed to do, and found them harmless and unexciting. They might have been exciting, however, if we had chosen to drink a sufficiency of them. To close our first day in Paris cheerfully and pleasantly, we now sought our grand room in the Grand Hotel de Louvre and climbed into our sumptuous bed to read and smoke. But alas, it was pitiful in a whole city full gas we had none. Joke by the doctor. No gas to read by, nothing but dismal candles. It was a shame. We tried to map out excursions for the morrow. We puzzled over French guides to Paris we talked disjointedly in a vain endeavor to make head or tail of the wild chaos of the day's sights and experiences. We subsided into indolent smoking. We gaped and yawned and stretched, then fe feebly wondered if we were really and truly in renowned Paris and drifted drowsily away into that vast, mysterious void which men call sleep. Chapter 13 The next morning we were up and dressed at ten o'clock. We went to the commissionaire of the hotel. I don't know what a commissionaire is, but that is what the man but that is the man we went to, and told him we wanted a guide. He said the National Exposition had drawn such multitudes of Englishmen and Americans to Paris that it would be next to impossible to find a good guide unemployed. He said he usually kept a dozen or two on hand, but he only had three now. He called them. One looked so very like a pirate that we let him go at once. The next one spoke with a simpering precision of pronunciation that was irritating, and said, If the gentleman's will to me make the grand honor to me retain him his service, I shall show to him everything that is magnifique to look upon in the beautiful Paris. I speak the English parfaitement. He would have done well to have stopped there, because he had that much by heart and said it right off without making mistake, but his self-complacency seduced him into attempting a flight into regions of unexplored English, and the reckless experiment was his ruin. Within ten seconds, he was so tangled up in a maze of mutilated verbs and torn and bleeding from forms of speech that no human ingenuity could ever have gotten him out of it with, a credit, with credit. It was plain enough that he could not speak -y the English quite as parfaitement as he pretended he could. The third man captured us. He was plainly dressed, but he had a noticeable air of neatness about him. He wore a high silk hat, which was a little old, but had been carefully brushed. 
He wore secondhand kid gloves in good repair and carried a small rattan cane with a curved handle, a female leg of ivory. He stepped as gently and as daintily as a cat crossing a muddy street, and oh, he was urbanity. He was quiet, unobtrusive self-possession. He was deference itself. He spoke softly and guardedly, and when he was about to make a statement on his sole responsibility or offer a suggestion, he waited by drachms and scruples first. With the crook of his little stick placed meditatively to his teeth, his opening speech was perfect. It was perfect in construction, in phraseology, in grammar, in emphasis, in pronunciation, everything. He spoke little and guardedly after that. We were charmed. We were more than charmed. We were overjoyed. We hired him at once. We never even asked him his price. This man, our lackey, our servant, our unquestioning slave, though he was, was still a gentleman. We could see that. While of the other two, one was coarse and awkward, and the other was a born pirate. We asked our man Friday's name. He drew from his pocketbook a snowy little card and passed it to us with a profound bow. A. Billfinger, Guide to Paris, France, Germany, Spain, etc., etc., Grand Hotel de Louvre. Billfinger, oh, carry me home to die. That was an aside from Dan. The atrocious name grated harshly on my ear, too. The most of us can learn to forgive and... Even to like a countenance that strikes us pleasantly at first, but few of us, I fancy, become reconciled to a jarring name so easily. I was almost sorry we had hired this man. His name was so unbearable. However, no matter. We were impatient to start. Billfinger stepped to the door to call a carriage, and then the doctor said, Well, the guide goes with the barber shop, with the billiard table, with the castless room and maybe with many other, many another pretty romance of Paris. I expected to have a guide named Henri de Montserrat, or Armand de la Chartreuse, or something that would sound grand in letters to the village at home. But to think of a Frenchman named of Billfinger. No, oh, this is absurd, you know. This will never do. We can't say Billfinger. It is nauseating. Name him over again. What had we better call him? Alexis de Calincourt? Alphonse Henry Gustave de Hauteville, I suggested. Call him Ferguson, said Dan. That was practical, unromantic good sense. Without debate, we expunged Billfinger as Billfinger and called him Ferguson. The carriage, an open barouche, was ready. Ferguson mounted beside the driver and we whirled away to breakfast as was proper. As was proper, Mr. Ferguson stood by to transmit our orders and answer questions. By and by, he mentioned casually, the artful adventurer, that he would go and get his breakfast as soon as we had finished ours. He knew we could not get along without him, and that we would not want to loiter about and wait for him. We asked him to sit down and eat with us. He begged, with many a bow, to be excused. It was not proper, he said. He would sit at another table. We ordered him peremptorily to sit down with us. Here endeth the first lesson. It was a mistake. <clears throat> as long as we had that fellow after that, he was always hungry. He was always thirsty. He came early. He stayed late. He could not pass a restaurant. He looked with a lecherous eye upon every wine shop. Suggestions to stop, excuses to eat and drink were forever on his lips. We tried all we could to fill him so full that he would have no room to spare for a fortnight, but it was a failure. He did not hold enough to smother the cravings of his superhuman appetite. He had another discrepancy about him. He was always wanting us to buy things. On the shallowest pretenses, he would inveigle us into shirt stores, boot stores, tailor shops, glove shops, anywhere under the broad sweep of the heavens that there seemed a chance of our buying anything. Anyone could have guessed that the shopkeepers paid him a percentage on the sales, 
but on our in our blessed innocence we didn't until this feature of his conduct grew unbearably prominent. One day Dan happened to mention that he thought of buying three or four three or four silk dresses patterns for presents. Ferguson's hungry eye was upon him in an instant. In the course of twenty minutes the carriage was stopped. What's this? This is the finest silk magazine in Paris, the most celebrate. What did you come here for? We told you to take us to the Palace of the Louvre. I suppose the gentlemen say he wants to buy some silk. You are not required to suppose things for the party, Ferguson. We do not wish to tax your energies too much. We will bear some of the burden and heat of the day ourselves. We will endeavor to do such supposing as is really necessary to be done. Drive on, so spake the doctor. Within fifteen minutes, the carriage halted again. <clears throat> and before another silk store, the doctor said, Ah, the Palace of the Louvre, beautiful, beautiful edifice. Does the Emperor Napoleon live here now, Ferguson? Ah, doctor, you jest. This is not the palace. We come there directly. But since we pass right by this store, where is such beautiful silk? Ah, I see. I meant to have told you that we did not wish to buy any silks today. But in my absent-mindedness, I forgot it. I also meant to tell you that we wish to go directly to the Louvre, but I forgot that also. However, we will go there now. Pardon my singing, seeming carelessness, Ferguson. Drive on. Within the half hour, we stopped again in front of another silk store. We were angry, but the doctor, always, always serene, always smooth-voiced, he said, At last, how imposing the Louvre is! And yet how small, how exquisitely fashioned, how charmingly situated, venerable, venerable pile. Pardon, doctor, this is not the Louvre, it is... What is it? I have the idea, it comes to me in a moment, that the silk in this magazine... That we did not wish to buy any silks today, and I also intended to tell you that we yearned to go immediately to the palace of the Louvre. But employing the happiness of seeing you devour four breakfasts this morning has so filled me with pleasurable emotions that I neglect the commonest interests of the time. However, we will proceed now to the Louvre, Ferguson. But, Doctor, excitedly, it will take not a minute, not but one small minute. The gentleman need not to buy if he wish not to, but only look at the silk, look at the beautiful fabric. Then, then pleadingly, Sir, just only one little moment. Dan said, Confound the idiot, I don't want to see any silks today, and I won't look at them. Drive on. And the doctor, We need no silks now, Ferguson. Our hearts yearn for the Louvre. Let us journey on. Let us journey on. But doctor, it is only one moment, one lethal moment, and the time will be safe, entirely safe, because there is nothing to see now. It is too late. It went ten minutes to four, and the Louvre closes at four. Only one needle moment, Doctor. The treacherous miscreant, after four breakfasts and a gallon of champagne, to serve us such a scurvy trick. We got no sight of the countless treasures of art in the Louvre galleries that day, and our only poor little satisfaction was in the reflection that Ferguson sold not a solitary silk dress pattern. I am writing this part, chapter partly for the satisfaction of abusing that accomplished knave, Billfinger, and partly to show whosoever shall read this how Americans fare at the hands of the Paris guides, and what sort of people Paris guides are. It need not be supposed that we were a stupider or an easier prey than our countrymen generally are, for we were not. The guides deceive and defraud every American who goes to Paris for the first time and sees its sights alone or in company with others as little experienced as himself. I shall visit Paris again some day, and then let the guides beware. I shall go in my war paint. I shall carry my tomahawk along. I think we have lost but little time in Paris. We have gone to bed every night tired out. Of course, we visited the renowned International Exposition. All the world did that. We went there on our third day in Paris, and we stayed there nearly two hours. That was our first and last visit. 
To tell the truth, we saw at a glance that one would have to spend three weeks, yea, even months, in that monstrous establishment to get an intelligible idea of it. It was a wonderful show, but the moving masses of people of all nations we saw there were still a more wonderful show. I discovered that if I were to stay there a month, I should still find myself looking at the people instead of the inanimate objects on exhibition. I got a little interested in some curious old tapestries of the 13th century, but a party of Arabs came by, and their dusky faces and quaint costumes called my attention away at once. I watched a silver swan which had a living grace about its movements and a living intelligence in its eyes, watched him swimming about as comfortably and unconcernedly as if he had been born in a morass instead of a jeweler's shop, watched him seize a silver fish from under the water and hold up his head and go through all the customary and elaborate motions of swallowing it. But the moment it disappeared down its throat, some tattooed South Sea Islanders approached and I yielded to their attractions. Presently, I found a revolving pistol several hundred years old, which looked strangely like a modern colt. But just then, I heard that the Empress of the French was in another part of the building and hastened away to see what she might look like. We heard martial music. We saw an unusual number of soldiers walking hurriedly about. There was a general movement among the people. We inquired what it was all about and learned that the Emperor of the French and the Sultan of Turkey were about to review 25,000 troops in the Arc de Toil. We immediately departed. I had a greater anxiety to see these men than I could have had to see 20 expositions. We drove away and took up a position in an open space opposite the American minister's house. A speculator bridged a couple of barrels with a board, and we hired standing places on it. Presently, there was a sound of distant music. In another minute, a pillar of dust came moving slowly toward us. A moment more, and then, with colors flying and a grand crash of military music, a gallant array of cavalrymen emerged from the dust and came down the street on a gentle trot. After them came a long line of artillery, then more cavalry, in splendid uniforms, and then their impartial imperial majesties, Napoleon III and Abdul Aziz. The vast concourse of people swung their hats and shouted. The windows and housetops in the wide vicinity burst into a snowstorm of waving handkerchiefs, and the wavers of the same mingled their cheers with those of the masses below. It was a stirring spectacle. But the two central figures claimed all my attention. Was ever such a contrast set up for a multitude till then? Napoleon in military uniform, a long-bodied, short-legged man, fiercely mustached, old, wrinkled, with eyes half-closed, and such a deep, crafty, scheming expression about them. Napoleon, bowing ever so gently to the loud plaudits, and watching everything and everybody with his cat eyes from under his depressed hat brim, as if to discover any sign that those cheers were not heartfelt and cordial. Abdul Aziz, absolute lord of the Ottoman Empire, clad in dark green European clothes, almost without ornament or insignia of rank, a red Turkish fez on his head, a short, stout, Dark man, black-bearded and black eyes, stupid, unprepossessing, a man whose whole appearance somehow suggested that if he only had a cleaver in his hand and a white apron on, one would not be at all surprised to hear him say, A mutton roast today, or you will have a nice porterhouse steak. Napoleon III, the representative of the highest modern civilization, progress, and refinement, Abdul Aziz, the representative of a people by nature and training, filthy, brutish, ignorant, unprogressive, superstitious, and a government whose three graces are tyranny, rapacity, blood. Here in brilliant Paris, under this majestic arch of triumph, the first century greets the 19th. 
Napoleon III, Emperor of France, surrounded by a shouting thousands, by military pomp, by the splendors of his capital city, and companioned by kings and princes. This is the man who was sneered at and reviled and called bastard, yet who was dreaming of a crown and an empire all the while, who was driven into exile, but carried his dreams with him, who associated with the common herd in America, ran foot races for a wager, but still sat upon a throne in fancy, who braved every danger to go to his dying mother, and grieved that she could not be spared to see him cast aside his plebeian vestments for the purple of royalty, who kept his faithful watch and walked his weary beat a common policeman of London, but dreamed the while of a coming night when he should tread the long-drawn corridors of the Tuileries, who made the miserable fiasco of Strasbourg, saw his poor, shabby eagle, forgetful of its lesson, refused to perch upon his shoulder, delivered his carefully prepared, sententious burst of eloquence upon unsympathetic ears, found himself a prisoner, the butt of small wits, a mark for the pitiless ridicule of all the world, yet went on dreaming of coronations and splendid pageants as before, who lay a forgotten captive in the dungeons of Ham, and still schemed and planned and pondered over future glory and future power. President of France at last, a coup d'etat and surrounded by applauding armies, welcomed by the thunders of cannon, he mounts a throne and waves before an astounded world the scepter of a mighty empire. Who talks of the marvels of fiction? Who speaks of the wonders of romance? Who prates of the tame achievements of Aladdin and the McGill of Arabia? Abdul Aziz, Sultan of Turkey, Lord of the Ottoman Empire, born to a throne, weak, stupid, ignorant, almost as his meanest slave chief of a vast royalty, yet the puppet of his premier, and the obedient child of a tyrannical mother, a man who sits upon a throne, the back of whose finger moves navies and armies, who holds in his hands the power of life and death over millions, yet who sleeps, sleeps, eats, eats, idles with his eight hundred concubines, and when he is surfeited with eating and sleeping and idling, and would rouse up and take the reins of government and threaten to be a sultan, is charmed from his purpose by a wary foul pacha with a pretty plan for a new palace or a new ship. Charmed away with a new toy, like any other restless child. A man who sees his people robbed and oppressed by soulless tax gatherers, but speaks no word to save them. Who believes in gnomes and genie, and the wild fables of the Arabian Nights, but has small regard for the mighty magicians of today, and is nervous in the presence of their mysterious railroads and steamboats and telegraphs, who would see undone in Egypt all the great Mehet Ali achieved, and would prefer rather to forget than emulate him. A man who found his great empire a blot upon the earth, a degraded, poverty-stricken, miserable, infamous agglomeration of ignorance, crime, and brutality, and will idle away the allotted days of his trivial life, and then pass to the dust and the worms, and leave it so. Napoleon has augmented the commercial prosperity of France in ten years to such a degree that figures can hardly compute it. He has rebuilt Paris, and has partly rebuilt every city in the state. He condemns a whole street at a time, assesses the damages, pays them, and rebuilds superbly. Then speculators buy up the ground and sell, but the original owner is given the first choice by the government at a stated price before the speculator is permitted to purchase. But above all things, he has taken the sole control of the empire of France into his hands and made it a tolerably free land for people who will not attempt to go too far in meddling with government affairs. No country offers greater security to life and prosperity than France, and one has all the freedom he wants, but no license, no license to interfere with anybody or make anyone uncomfortable. As for the Sultan, 
one could set a trap anywhere and catch a dozen abler men in a night. The band struck up, and the brilliant adventurer, Napoleon III, had the genius of energy, persistence, enterprise, and the feeble Abdul Aziz, the genius of ignorance, bigotry, and indolence, prepared for forward march. We saw the splendid review. We saw the white-mustached old Crimean soldier, Grand Robert, Marshal of France. We saw, well, we saw everything. And then we went home satisfied. <laughs>